Hi guys. Say hi. Zane and Judy here with Nature Preserve Life. We're on our three day weekend and yeah. heading into town to get some chores done. But we're taking you along to share some of the sights and sounds and we hope you enjoy this episode. So here's what it looks like the other direction. Driving into town. I'm probably going a little faster than I should. I'll uh, try to slow down as I film here, but this is some of the scenery you're going to see through the dirty windshield, but anyway, I'll show more as we get into town. So we're in town now, and behind us is some town offices. I think there's a sign over there, right there, and one of the town offices is the uh, motor vehicle department. And we just wanted to give you a heads up about that, especially if you're moving to New Mexico for the first time. Um, our little MVD, which everywhere else I've lived, it's always called Department of Motor Vehicles, uh, Motor Vehicle Department instead. But uh, they're kind of tricky um, dealing with. You gotta be alert. They will try to maximize any valuation related issues for titled vehicles. Um, to the maximum they think they can get away with and if you challenge them which I've done once before and successfully but it took a while and it took a lot of additional documentation and fighting with them and going over the clerk's head um, she eventually called her boss like in Santa Fe or something uh, to get the permission to override whatever but what they'll do is like if you're coming in from out of state or you're buying something even in state They'll look at the invoice or the sales order that you had and they will base their used to be 3% tax it apply that you had to pay. Now it's I think 4%. But they would do that based off of the largest number they can find, the MSRP, on any document you bring them. And even though it shows like a total final price on it, they will not accept that um, because they'll always assume any kind of like discount like internet discount or discount you negotiated Oops. could be something like a trade-in right. which I've argued with them listen if it was a trade-in it would have been documented here but it's not it's just a simple discount off of MSRP and they have to record so the dealerships you're dealing with of course have to usually document somewhere that they're starting at MSRP to appease the factory, the manufacturer. And then of course there's whatever discount you can get from the dealership, whether it's an internet discount or something else. But just be on the watch and be yeah. careful with MVD. Yeah, just be mindful and yeah. make sure you have all your little chicks in order um, just in case. Yeah. Because yeah, you want to, I guess you want to pay the least amount. <laughs> Yeah, it can cost you hundreds of dollars in additional taxes yeah. that you'll end up paying yep. if you don't catch it up front. You right. know, the first time that happened to us, I didn't catch it until we were walking across the parking lot, and then I noticed this doesn't look right. So the next time I came in kind of prepared to try to catch that. And they will do everything they can to try to grab what they're not entitled to. So just be careful, be aware, and be ready for your fight to save yourself a few hundred bucks typically from one of these things, especially if you're moving in multiple vehicles from out of state or you have a recent purchase, it can be a, a battle. Yep. So it can be tricky. On to our next stop. Okay. Okay, another little pit stop in town is at the Mustang Diner. And we just, it was a tough choice between the Mustang and the Alpine Cafe. The Alpine's got some really good uh, lattes, especially I love their dirty chai latte. And especially ice this time of year now that it's getting a little warmer weather. But the of the Mustang in this wonderful weather is what did we get, Judy? Unsweetened raspberry tea. Iced, Iced tea. tea. And look at how big these are. These are monsters. They're huge. And so it was like two for four dollars and thirty-one cents. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> okay, let's get back on the road. Here's the last uh, ruins in the area that we haven't been to yet, so we're going to go ahead and turn up the road here. It looks like it's about an, a mile ahead outside of Manzano, so I guess it was uh, 
the Wa Pueblo Indian Village from the 1200s to the 1670s. And uh, of course on the eastern end of the Manzano Mountains, which you can't quite see them that well from here. We'll be driving a little closer to them here shortly. Can you help us with the pronunciation again? Uh, absolutely, it's uh, quite I. Okay. <laughs> That's quite the tongue, tongue twist, twist right? yeah, I know yeah. I would have butchered it earlier. You, you uh, can't uh, roll your R's, choir I, it's fine too. <laughs> uh, it's a Puebloan word that got sang, sort of uh, anglicized by the Spanish. Cool. Uh, yeah, so how uh, familiar are you with the uh, history of this place? We're not. Mm, not really much. <laughs> uh, wonderful. Well, uh, oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, I didn't see this uh, earlier. Very oh, accurate, Mom. Um, Way back in the 1600s, uh, the Spanish came over um, and uh, looking for different natural resources here in New Mexico, they couldn't really find anything, uh, except they did find people. So they realized there were souls to save. Uh, and so they brought over Christianity, they brought over gifts like uh, almonds and dates and chocolates. Um, and eventually, uh, at the beginning, uh, there was actually a very good working relationship between the two people. Uh, the, uh, Puebloan people were polytheistic. They had a bunch of different gods that they worshipped. Uh, and so um, the Spanish came over with uh, Christianity. They said, absolutely, we'll uh, uh, help you build this church. We can add that to our pantheon. We can sort of uh, appreciate the way that you, um, uh, that the way that you pray and your religion. Um, uh, but over time, as you might be able to imagine, the Spanish weren't actually very happy with that. Uh, in about 1670 or so, word came down from the Spanish crown. Uh, that uh, the Pueblo and people uh, were, could not have their polytheistic uh, beliefs. They instead had to believe in, they had to convert to Christianity and have that be the only faith that they had. Um, so uh, over time, that led to uh, the destruction uh, and banning of things like uh, the Pueblo and people's religious practices, such as the Kivas, which you can see is these uh, right here, scattered all around. Uh, you'll even see one out there when you're uh, looking at the church. It's on the far side. You'll see the remains of one. Um, those were those circular buildings are kivas. Uh, they are the places of uh, religious worship for the Puebloan people. They would uh, uh, climb inside of those, put on things called a, uh, uh, put on these masks, uh, kachina masks. They would do rain dances, uh, prayer, things like that. But around this time, the Spanish people uh, were heavily persecuting the Puebloan people. Uh, they would. Um, uh, they destroy the kibas, they destroy the masks, uh, and uh, this strife built up more and more, eventually leading to the Pueblo and people revolting, um, uh, and a lot more strife between the two people, uh, including uh, some a many year-long famine and drought. And as a result of all of that, um, uh, as a result of all that, uh, both parties just found themselves having to leave the area. That's too bad. Wow. I assume this this is a pretty good representation from the archaeological. Yeah, it's it's generally made. pretty uh, period accurate. Uh, and as you uh, look around, you might be able to you might expect that you'd see more of these pueblos around. Uh, the reason that you can't see many of them uh, is that these ones here, for example, uh, we think that those are actually underneath those hills over to our left. Okay. Um, uh, and also further uh, more uh, the, the more of these pueblos that are out and around. The reason you don't see those is that uh, uh, later on, after the area had been vacated, um, uh, cattle ranchers and other uh, uh, people had come to the area and needed uh, means to build their own infrastructure, so they just used the houses and the stone and the mortar that was already here. So Judy grabbed a, oh. a little souvenir here, the trail guide, so that'll help. But <coughs> there's picnic areas. The trailhead for the Spanish Corral, the Mission Ruins Loop Trail, which I think yeah. this one to the right probably just loops all the way around, comes right back to where we're at. I'm going to just take us down to uh, the major uh, ruins here that's still available to be seen. There's remnants that are probably still buried of the actual Pueblo, the native Pueblos. Uh, that were here back in the day. So, see what we find up here. 
we've been warned there's plenty of rattlesnake sightings through here so we're trying our best to keep our eyes peeled and not so much on the camera here yeah you know the <laughs> ranger was saying that he went for a walk and he heard the rattle or yeah uh, so i believe they they do alert you so you can back off yeah but still there's little markers here along the way okay that says two what does it say about number two here's two i think i had to go to a few other pages here to probably okay that's the, the actual the pueblo pueblo huh? yep it would have been right up in here on this hill somewhere yeah, you see back to the visitor center yeah, where we came from. The hills around you are actually the remains of a large masonry Indian village or pueblo, and that's what he was saying. They're they're buried. And number three here, they haven't been excavated and uh, they haven't done an archaeological dig. It looks like, and even if they wanted to, they had funding and all that. I don't know if they could because it's, you know, native historical uh, stuff. There might be issues with that. I would think there's a lot of rules and stuff, right? The two Tiwi, Tiwa people are here around 1300. So their ruins are probably right out here. Yeah, they farmed, they hunted, they gathered salt from the Tiwi lake. That's neat. On number four. Maybe a little closer up picture. I'm not sure we're gonna hike too much into here. It's uh, nice just seeing it from here. Like like we were saying earlier, there's could be snakes around here. I don't want to be dodging snakes. Kind of like a little bit like Indiana Jones, not real friendly to snakes. Ran into a couple of them as a young child. Not a fun incident. Didn't get bit, but boy, they, when you see a big one in your backyard as a kid you, and you get warned about them, you start to develop a respect for them. What did them. your mother say? You went and probably ran and got your mom, right? No, she was there with me, luckily. Oh, she was the one wow. that said, stand absolutely she, still. Okay, she kept her wit about her. Nice. <laughs> and we did. We were picking strawberries <laughs> in the backyard, and there was a big rattler crawling on by us. And, and I, where was that at, love? In Sierra Madre, Sierra California. Madre, California. Wow, who would have thought? Okay. And he went just sliding on by us. <laughs> uh, administering building for the faith in the neighboring pueblos of Abo and Chilili. When the first Spanish missionary came to Coari in 1627, Juan Gutierrez de la Chica arrived with only a cartload of tools in his books. Within five years, Tiwa women under Gutierrez's instruction had built the sandstone and adobe church. Convento and corrals, you see here, that conflict between New Mexico's missionaries and King's men overshadowed the new life brought by the friars before the church was even 10 years old. For the next 35 years, the people of Corrari would see more than their face, fair share of trials and trouble. Judy's getting way ahead of me. I'm not sure if you can see her way down there. She better be watching for snakes. Anyway, it's Judy's idea to keep pushing forward here. Wow. You see the little header beam here. And all the sandstone and looks like mud adobe. There's a cement, yeah. Comes off pretty easy. But it's neat seeing the interior of this. What it must have been like back in the day with a roof on it. 
guess I can step on in. Just get you an idea of the size of these sandstone walls. See how where Judy's at. Yeah, more uh, structural support there. And then underneath is this log. Yeah, the logs are the headers for that window. You gotta wonder about these little holes here. We should ask the the ranger. park ranger if uh, these were like used for battle <laughs> or something, defensive uh, stuff for rifles or muskets in those days, most likely. Or if there was ever any cannons, or more likely, this was all like this stuff vent up here would probably be used for venting heat out of the the church here into the air, probably sucking some cold air in from down lower. Wouldn't be surprised if there's some lower vents. Anyway, let's just get a look at the back here. Wow. This is crazy. <sighs> yeah, they were entering into a little maze here. Okay, well, I think I'm getting close to it. I think it might be over here, babe. I'm over here. There's 11. Is this 11? Yeah. yeah. So this appears to be the kiva where the natives would have worshipped. Just a lot of ruins here. A lot to go through. And of course there's actually some nice New Mexico scenery. The trees are kind of nice. Must be a little river coming through here or creek or something I bet for all the vegetation to support it. Yeah, I just had to share. We drive by this from time to time. It's as you're entering the town of Manzano. It's uh, an old adobe and stone kind of old homes here, former remnants of them. You can see in the distance there, the one in the back is more of adobe construction. And it even has an electrical panel and some plumbing vents and all that. While this newer other one closer to me has got, it looks like it's mostly stone construction. I'm sure it's pretty old. Anyway, there's a little, uh, quite a few of these around various parts of New Mexico, and I'm hoping in the near future here to collect more of them as we get permission. This is, uh, you know, I'm on the, not on any private property right now, so I can go, go ahead and film this, but uh, in the future I'm hoping to get, as we find more of these, the uh, owner's permissions to like go up close onto their property and look at these in more detail. Cheers. Okay, one of the other things we're looking for is a rumored uh, apple orchard. And uh, this is we're able to find. I'm not sure if this is really a apple orchard out here or not. It does talk about Harvest Festival parking with Apple Store. But as you can see, the gate's closed. But there's also more mention out here of things up ahead so we're gonna go explore and see what's here or uh, this little uh, Apple store I guess is nestled 
up along the Manzano Mountains here. Yeah, this does look like a small orchard. The trees look pretty young. Oh, the babies look shady there. Yeah. That, that does look like an orchard over there. And of course. So here's more orchards, the house or cabins that they rent are up here too. This is more of a retreat area from what I understand of their website. But you see there's definitely apple trees here. Yeah, high fences so the deer stays out of them. Yeah, it doesn't eat the product. Eating all their apples. And here's oh, look at the, lodge. the house, the wow. lodge. Oh my gosh, that's awesome. Pretty cool. Yeah, wow. So the Manzano uh, apple orchard here, we just spoke with, uh, I think one of the owners. Yeah. I'm not sure how the family arrangement is. But the gentleman's name was Guy. He's uh, moved out here like eight months ago and bought this property and they're turning it into a big retreat. There's little cabins through here. They got a restaurant that's open periodically in the main uh, lodge there. But here's a picture of one of the cabins, I think. And... There's apple orchards. Yep, or, so more of the orchards. So when they're ready, you can come pick apples. Pretty cool. They have a harvest festival on like four or five weekends in September and October and we'll be on their website. And we'll link their website down in the description here. Anyway, we're on our way to, there's a little lake or pond or something back here. This loops around the orchard. I'm pretty sure the Pono House, one of the other cabins. Oh. Must have missed a turn, but hammocks. Nice little cabin to stay at. It's a nice little retreat in the pines. Let's figure out turning around and what we did wrong because this road was supposed to take us to a pond. Nice. And it looks like things are kind of blocked off a bit, but there's a pond down here. I can see a boat dock. I'll try to zoom up a little more. See the boat dock right there in the center of the picture. Small little pond, but I can imagine it's a nice place to sit and uh, sip a little coffee in the morning. To the right where this fort was another cabin, I think. And this must be the little camper that guys living in that he mentioned. But yeah, I think uh, to the right there is another little cabin down there. But here's our little country store. They got some basic supplies. And their little restaurant. This is the main area here. Yep. And more of the big orchard here. This again was the front of the lot, main lodge here. 
well like I said I'll put the in the description their website so if you're out in this area and you check out some activities or want a nice quiet place to stay in the east side of the Manzano Mountains there or if you have a big family reunion coming up this would be perfect or a wedding down by that wedding. pond yeah. whatever This is a, definitely a peaceful little place out here. And that must be the zip lines there they're talking about. Yeah, we'll try the zip line in the fall. We'll be out here again. We'll give a more thorough tour when uh, we have access to more activities and products to purchase. They, and mentioned what 39 different varieties of apples, apples. so there's a good chance they have your favorite here this again was the entrance from the other direction of the apple store they actually have the gate open now 